Hey there, welcome to my channel. Today we're going to test a method to revive or extend the life of lead acid car batteries using a welder. The methods I use will be derived primarily from Sweet Project Cars video on battery maintenance and Uncle Tony's Garage's video on reviving old batteries. In Sweet Project Cars video, he uses a welder to overcharge and boil a lead acid battery with the vent caps removed through five cycles of five minutes on, with the welder turned up just high enough to bring the battery to a boil. I'm going to attempt my own method with a ride and power supply first and then move on to using my welder for the rest of the batteries. I have two pairs of batteries here. Each pair is two identical batteries that were bought at the same time and used in parallel on a diesel truck, so they have experienced the same level of use and abuse in their lifetimes. One pair is Energizer brand, the other pair is Deca brand. One battery from each brand will have a piece of blue tape on it to differentiate it from its twin. Starting out with one of the Energizer batteries, I'm measuring the open circuit voltage before attempting revival. 0.18 volts. Oh man, this isn't looking good. I start by lifting up the vent covers just slightly but not enough to break the seal, and then I use compressed air to blow the dirt out from underneath. Next, I'd have the cells off and the battery with distilled water. Don't use one of these little squirt bottles in the interest of being careful. It takes forever. A dropper would be much faster. Ordinarily, I would use my ride and power supply at 14.5 volts to trickle charge the battery to recovery. This has only worked sometimes and usually only with a battery that can still crank an engine over. Today, I've set the voltage much higher in hopes of causing the electrolyte to bubble without using a welder. Here, as I adjust the voltage up towards 55 volts, I see some of the cells rise and start to bubble. I make some more adjustments until it starts to pull the full 12 amps that my power supply can provide. I leave this running for 5 minutes, then shut the power supply off and let the battery rest for some time. By the end of the first run, the battery has fallen to 24 volts at 12 amps. Here is the end of the second 5 minute cycle, which resulted in a similar current and voltage to the first. Now toward the end of the third cycle, the battery is at 21 volts and 12 amps. Near the end of the fourth cycle, we're at 20.2 volts and 12 amps. And at the end of the fifth cycle, the battery is charging at 19.9 .9 volts and 12 amps. I feel it is noteworthy to point out that before starting the fifth cycle, the open circuit voltage of the battery had reached 11.4 volts, although for at least 24 hours after a charge, that number can drop, and 11.4 volts is far from a full recovery, though promising. Since we still have a way to go on recovering this battery, I'm switching over to my welder to see if we can't make more significant progress. Since these are side post batteries, I have bolts installed into each post with some braided copper between the bolt and the clamps to provide a more conductive path as we will be driving higher currents than with the ride-in. This is the first run with the welder. I adjusted the current a little bit and settled around 30 amps for this run. The battery bubbled vigorously during this run and I cleaned up the spillage with a shop rag. I added a multimeter to measure the voltage after completing this cycle and the voltage was 11.9 volts. After letting the battery rest for some time, the voltage was 11.6 volts and falling. After a 10 minute off period, I started the second cycle with the welder at 30 amps and the battery settled to 25 volts. Near the end of the run, I decided to give the battery a shorter pulse of 40 amps to see how it would respond. For the next run, I gave it 4 minutes of 35 amps and then turned it up to 40 amps. It took 26.5 volts to drive the battery at 40 amps. After this cycle, the battery settled to 11.4 volts open circuit shortly after ending the test. This isn't a good sign as that's lower than some of the earlier numbers we saw. After another 10 minutes, the battery settled to 8.62 volts. This is much lower than what we had gotten after the first few runs with the Bryden power supply. At the end of the next cycle, we were pushing 35 amps at 20.3 volts. It became apparent that one or more cells had shorted inside the battery, so I attempted some percussive maintenance with a dead blow hammer and was able to temporarily coerce the battery to a higher open circuit voltage. I tried this several more times during my tests, and any time a cell seemed to have shorted, it sometimes worked, other times it didn't, and ultimately the damaged cells always reverted to their shorted state. After this cycle, the battery settled to somewhere above 11 volts, which seemed to be an improvement. After several attempts at charging the battery at 14.5 volts with the ride and power supply, I was unable to get the battery open circuit voltage above 9.6 volts. After some more time, the battery open circuit voltage settled to 6 volts, indicating multiple cells were shorted inside the battery. Unfortunately, this is where my testing method started to break down a little. Moving to the DECA battery pair, I was unable to remove the vent covers as they were glued on. While I'm sure they are possible to remove, I decided instead to approach charging these batteries only with the Raiden power supply and at a lower voltage to avoid shorting any cells as I had done with the high current on the welder. After the first charge cycle, I used an old resistive battery tester to test the battery cranking amps. The result of this was not impressive. I was also hoping for some other videos out there that some loading on the battery between charge cycles would help break sulfation off the battery plates. Following some attempts with that, I decided to try the second Energizer battery. I started again by slightly lifting the caps and blowing the dirt out from underneath. 
I decided to work on this battery outside as I noticed some mild stinging in my respiratory tract previously, even with a large door open to vent the gases. Contrary to what one of the YouTubers said, Electrolyte can and does boil a lot of these batteries during this process, and while I don't believe my exposure was concentrated enough to cause any damage, this is something you need to keep in mind while operating on lead-acid batteries. I ran several cycles on the second energizer battery similar to the first, but this time only using the welder and not attempting charging it to start with the Raiden power supply. I would like to note that my welder is fairly accurate when setting the current in stick mode, and the current clamp on the electrode holder verifies this. That said, many of the cheap $200 and under welders that are referenced by others performing battery refreshing and revival typically have far less honest current settings, and I have observed this in several videos with people testing the output of those. I decided to skip to the end on this one because there was no notable progress in the other two batteries I attempted to revive. The welder ended up causing shorted cells due to high intensity charge cycles in the second energizer battery, and while I had some success improving the voltage after charging with the dead blow hammer, the results were even less positive and shorter lived than with the first energizer battery. With the deck of batteries, I spent several days and nights charging them at 14.5 volts with the Raiden power supply over the course of the week in hopes of seeing a big improvement in their performance. I was able to get one battery up to about 300 cold cranking amps and the second one a bit less. Both of these fell far short of the 600 cold cranking amps that the batteries were originally rated for. I anticipate the only thing that could possibly help those two is extended float charging for a month which I have not yet attempted. At the end of the day, one Energizer battery had an open circuit voltage of 6.3 and the other had an open circuit voltage of 9.6. There was no point in testing the cold cranking amps of either of these batteries since the OCVs ended up far lower than my target of at least 12.3, preferably 12.5 volts. Finally, testing one of the DECA batteries, the OCV managed to climb to 12.7 volts. While this seems promising, the cranking amps were low and fell rapidly through a short testing period. Cranking amps alone is arguably a more important indicator of the condition of the battery, but with a low OCV on a 12 volt battery, it is generally impossible to get a high current value. It may be possible with some extended charging that the current capacity could be improved, but I have not collected any data on this. For my conclusion, I would say don't buy any of the $150 range welders suggested by other YouTubers hoping to revive a $100 battery, at least around the time of filming this. I cannot say it is impossible to revive a battery using some of the methods touted elsewhere, but keep in mind that failure to do so is real and does happen, and aside from my own personal experience here, I have heard anecdotal evidence on both sides, with some people expending significant effort to revive batteries through several different methods while having limited to no success. I have not personally seen any videos where someone else has come to the conclusion that this is not a very effective process, but I personally believe there are several things likely contributing to this, including people being afraid to showcase their failures. It is also very possible that the YouTube algorithm does not favor this. To be fair, I haven't deliberately searched for any videos like that. If you're going to search for a how-to video, generally videos with failures in them don't tend to come up, but that is also just my opinion. And if you really want to buy one of those welders, buy it with the intent to start welding with it. I can't speak to the usefulness of an inexpensive welder as I did some research and went toward a lower cost but still not completely inexpensive brand when making my own purchase. This is likely one of those cases where you get what you pay for, but if you want a very low risk chance to experiment with some stick welding, give it a shot if you want to. One more note about the batteries, I think the thing that caused two of the Energizer batteries to short internally was applying too much heat and or too much heat for too long of a period of time. So. I think you'd probably have a better chance at not causing an internal short in the battery if you didn't go to the welder, especially for a significant period of time and the cells got quite warm during this process. And that seemed to really be the tipping point of what started to kill cells internally in those batteries. Once you've done that, I've never heard of anybody being able to revive that unless you're going to rebuild the inside of the battery. And at that point, my opinion is just go get a new one. In fact, my opinion is just go get a new one anyway. Unless it's been working in the fairly recent past and it really just needs a charge over a day or two to bring it back, I haven't had any luck reviving anything that's worse off than that so far. So that concludes our experiments for today. If you like this video, hit that like button. If you dislike it, you know what to do. And hit that subscribe button if you'd like to see more content like this in the future.